Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 170th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Euron Greyjoy from A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones. Out of all the villainous figures that we've been introduced to in the world of Ice and Fire, Euron stands out as perhaps the most intriguing in a number of ways. He's as brutal, sadistic, and vicious, or even more so, than Ramsay Bolton. He's as sly and Machiavellian as Peter Baelish. He holds within him an intellect and cunning that could match Tywin Lannister's, and he has as much magic and mystery surrounding his character as Melisandre of Ashai and the Shadow City she hails from. And when you add in the fact that at this point in time we really have no foolproof idea of what exactly Euron Greyjoy's goals are, which leaves much of who he is and what he wants up to considerable debate, and you have a character that's proved himself to be perhaps the most compelling villain George R.R. Martin has ever conceived. Now if you've only seen the show, this description of Euron might seem quite off. In the show, Euron was portrayed as a power-hungry and brutal pirate lord, who was ready to take his fleet of reavers to the nearest queen who would have him, so he might marry her and rule all of Westeros a la Joffrey, but bigger and badder. A man who made it quite clear that bums, and the fingers that go in them, are on the top of his priority list. And if that has been your only exposure to Euron, then you'd be forgiven for viewing him as a mostly forgettable character, who managed to accomplish at least a few noteworthy and memorable feats. So while I will be mentioning show Euron a few times, this video is more so about the Euron we receive in the books. However, because there are enough similarities between the two, much of what I have to say about book Euron can be applied to show Euron as well. So for the few ardent fans of that version of the character out there, consider the information you learn here as a sort of extended backstory for him. Now for fans of the books, the Euron we were given in the show was nothing short of a crime, as if you couldn't tell by the description I gave you of him earlier, the character we receive in the books is one of the most fascinating and horrifying evildoers ever conceived. But unfortunately, at the time of the making of this video, the books haven't been finished yet, and because of that, as I mentioned earlier, much of who Euron is, and what he's really up to, is subject to debate. And there are dozens of theories you can find out there that attempt to use the numerous hints that Martin has given us in the text to try and figure these things out while we wait patiently for the next two books. Now because his character is so mysterious and open to interpretation at this point, any one of the myriad theories out there could be central to understanding the evil of Euron Greyjoy, so I've chosen to mention quite a few of them in this video, all of which have helped me to better flesh out my own theory on Euron, and have pointed me towards some potential information about him that I hadn't noticed. Like I said, there are dozens of theories out there, or dozens of write-ups and variations on those theories, so I can't mention them all in this video, but the ones I found most compelling, helpful, and probable were written by the following people over on Reddit and elsewhere. Lost Carcosa, Bail Bard, Yezen IRL, Genghis Kazoo, Sir Dunk the Lunk, and Vince That Was Promised. And links to all of their respective write-ups and essays can be found down in the description. And a special thanks to Las Carcosa and Bail Bard for taking some time out of their days to point me towards some information that I needed to include in this video. Also, for those of you who aren't aware, Euron, like Ramsay, is an exceptionally cruel and brutal character. And so we're going to be talking about some heavy subject matter in this video, some of which I've had to word differently to avoid offending the censors. And one thing in particular that you should be aware of is that when I use the word assault, I use it as a replacement for the R word that's used to denote when someone forces themselves on another. Now considering the constant political machinations the great houses of Westeros are engaged in, finding the truth in the world of ice and fire is a daunting task for the common folk and nobility alike. In our own world, it's difficult for us to do much the same thing when looking for reliable and unbiased sources of information, especially as far as the news is concerned. But with the help of our sponsor for this video, Ground News, you'll find that this daunting task becomes much easier. Ground News is a company focused on providing its readers with as much information about the information they're consuming as they possibly can. Ground News does so by gathering data through three different independent news monitoring organizations, organizations that gauge how different news outlets are reporting the same events based on criteria such as biases, factuality, and the ownership of the different companies creating articles on any given subject. This helps immensely in determining whether or not you're actually getting the full story when reading the news, or if you're only receiving a small piece of the puzzle based on what the source you're getting news from wants you to see. For example, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu just rejected Hamas's offer to secure the release of Israeli hostages in exchange for a ceasefire, but U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said an agreement between Israel and Hamas was still possible. Through Ground News, I can read a summary of this story based on 126 sources Ground News found reporting on it, including Blinken's own statement so I can compare his words with how the media is interpreting it. Below this, I can see these articles categorized by the source's political leaning, with tabs highlighting its reliability and ownership, helping me identify any potential bias that's influencing its reporting. Some left-leaning articles emphasize Blinken's urge to not dehumanize the innocent, while right-leaning articles bring up feelings of uncertainty by saying things like, a lot of work remains. 
Both articles come from highly reliable sources, but convey totally different messages, which is exactly why we can't rely on just one source for a comprehensive understanding of the world. So just like with characters like Euron Greyjoy, whose story needs to be examined by absorbing multiple different sources of information regarding his character, in order to understand how a man becomes a monster like him, it's important that we all take the time to make sure we're getting all the facts on any given situation, which makes a platform like Ground News a necessity. So go to groundnews.com slash violi to subscribe. Plans start at less than $1 a month, but my link gets you 40% off their unlimited access vantage plan, the same one that I personally use to better understand the parallels between the fictional worlds I'm so often entrenched in, and our very real one. Thank you, Ground News, for sponsoring this video. Now without further ado, let's begin. The life of Euron Greyjoy, like all the peoples of Westeros, is tied to the culture of his kingdom and his people, the Iron Islands and the Ironborn. Just as the people of each region of Westeros hold their own traditions apart from the few common values they all share, the Ironborn have over the course of thousands of years made themselves into a people unlike any other that can be found in the known world. And indeed they claim that they are a people whose origins are entirely separate from those of their fellow countrymen. Many of you may be familiar with the title the King or Queen of Westeros claims, that being Protector of the Realm, and King or Queen of the Andals, the Rhoynar, and the First Men. The Rhoynar portion of this title is omitted from the show. But regardless, these three cultural designations describe the three separate races that originally peopled Westeros. The First Men were, as their title suggests, the first peoples to cross the now sunken arm of Dorne from Essos into Westeros some 12,000 years ago. Up until the invasion of the Andals somewhere between 2 and 6,000 years ago, another people who traced their origins to Essos, the First Men were the primary ethnic group of Westeros. But after the coming of the Andals, and their destruction or assimilation of most of their kingdoms, a mixture between these two races slowly became dominant, though some do still have and claim pure First Men or Andal heritage. The last group of people to arrive in Westeros a thousand years before King Robert ascended the Iron Throne were the Rhoynar, a people who fled the terror of Old Valyria by crossing the Narrow Sea into Dorne, where they then intermixed with the existing peoples who then inhabited the region, creating the Dornish that we all know today. However, the legends of the Iron Islands tell a different story, one that involves the true First Men to inhabit Westeros, those who came from the sea as the children, of the Drowned God. Ironborn myths and history state that rather than their people's origins lying in a group of First Men settlers who managed to make their way to the islands, they were instead born directly from the sea as the children of their Drowned God. We did not come to these holy islands from godless lands across the seas, the priest Sauron Saltong once said. We came from beneath those seas, from the watery halls of the Drowned God, who made us in his likeness and gave to us dominion over all the waters of the earth. This notion is disputed amongst even the Ironborn, but when looking at the supposed history of the Ironborn, it's difficult to tell whether or not this is simply a legend that's been exaggerated over time or part of the truth. In the world of ice and fire, there are many magical things and people to be found in the present day and from the hundreds of legends you'll hear from the mouths of its many peoples. Claiming such magical origins for themselves, the Ironborn, and as with all legends in this world, and most of these legends seem to have a lot of truth to them, and the legends of the Ironborn are no different. After the Ironborn were granted life from the sea by their godly father, from amongst them rose a man known as the Grey King, a man who was said to have defeated the mighty sea dragon Naga in single combat, afterwards crafting his gruesome hull from her bones and taking her jaws and teeth as his seed and crown respectively. And all the great houses of the Ironborn claimed to be descended from this mythical Grey King and the hundred sons he fathered. While there's certainly varying degrees of truth present within this story, one particular object of mystery that seems to appear throughout the known world in various forms might support the Ironborn's supposed origins more than anything else present within their culture. Oily black stones of unknown origin. It is said that every building in Ashai, perhaps the most magically focused city left in this world, is molded out of this substance. Nearby in the jungles of the mostly unexplored continent of Sothorios lies the abandoned city of Yin a massive settlement which the surrounding jungle fears to grow in that was entirely constructed out of these oily black stones. Stones so large that it said it would take a dozen elephants to move a single one of them. Not far from Yin off the northwestern coast of Sothorios lies the Basilisk Isles, amongst which is an island that's known as the Isle of Toads. This island is said to be populated by a species of people who are described as having an unpleasant fish-like aspect to their faces along with webbed hands and feet. On this island lies its namesake, the Toadstone, an idol worshipped by its inhabitants, which appears to have been carved from a greasy black stone. But stones of a less greasy and oily origin can be found elsewhere as well. It's been said that the ancient bloodstone emperor of Yi-Ti, a devilish figure who practiced blood magic and potentially instigated the Long Night, rejected the gods of his people and worshipped a black stone that fell from the sky. 
the dragon roads out of Valyria, the black wall of Atlantis, and many of the buildings of Old Valyria were made from black stone that the Valyrians fused together with dragon fire. The five forts, massive fortresses that serve to guard the northeastern borders of Yi-Ti, are made of similarly fused black stone, and the foundation of the high tower in Old Town is a fortress made of the same fused black stone. And then upon the Iron Islands lies the Sea Stone Chair, a throne carved from the same oily black stone that was carved into the likeness of a kraken, the seat from which the High Kings of the Iron Islands, as well as the Lords of House Greyjoy, have ruled from for millennia. Now there's an obvious connection to be made here between the fish-like people of Toad Isle and the supposed seaborne origins of the Ironborn, which could indicate that these people are descended from the same common ancestor who colonized their respective islands, people who possibly originated from Ashai, Yin, or perhaps even Yi Ti. But these black stones offer us even more to work with regarding this theory. The fused black stone in the meteorite that the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped may or may not be related to the oily and greasy variety. But I think there's ample evidence to suggest that these oily stones used to build these structures are in fact related to one another, and not just coincidental occurrences. In Ashai and Yin, it's said that nothing dares to grow within the confines of these cities. And while we don't know what grows on the Isle of Toads, we do know that it's tough to grow anything on the Iron Islands. And perhaps the lack of vegetation there can be explained by the presence of the sea stone chair, a structure that isn't quite big enough to ensure that nothing grows on the islands, as small amounts of crops and grazing grass can be found there, and trees once grew here as well. But maybe the reason for this lack of vegetation lies within the influence of this comparatively small object made of this strange black substance, which prevents more complex forms of vegetative life from growing here. Another possible connection the Ironborn have to these stones are legends of their fearsome appearance on the battlefield in the Dawn Ages, evidence for which were given in a world of ice and fire. Many legends have come down to us through the millennia of the Salt Kings and Reavers who made the Sunset Sea their own, men as wild and cruel and fearless as any who have ever lived. Thus we hear of the likes of Torgon the Terrible, Yorl the Whale, Dagon Drum the Necromancer, Hrothgar of Pike and his Kraken Summoning Horn, and Ragged Ralph of Old Wick. Most infamous of all was Balon Blackskin, who fought with an axe in his left hand and a hammer in his right. No weapon made of man could harm him, it was said. Swords glanced off and left no mark, and axes shattered against his skin. Did such men ever truly walk the earth? It is hard to know, since most supposedly lived and died thousands of years before the Iron Men learned to write. Literacy remains rare in the Iron Islands to this day, and those who have the skill are oft marked as weaklings or feared as sorcerers. So much of what we know of these demigods of the dawn comes to us from the peoples they plundered and preyed upon, written in the old tongue and the runes of the first men. The lands the Reavers plundered were densely wooded but thinly peopled in those days. Then as now, the Ironborn were loath to go too far from the salt waters that sustained them, but they ruled the Sunset Sea from Bear Island and the Frozen Shore down to the Arbor. The feeble fishing boats and trading cogs of the First Men, which seldom ventured out of sight of land, were no match for the swift longships of the Iron Men, with their great sails and banks of oars. And when battle was joined upon the shores, mighty kings and famous warriors fell before the reavers like wheat before a scythe, in such numbers that the men of the Greenlands told each other that the Ironborn were demons risen from some watery hell, protected by fell sorceries and possessed of foul black weapons that drank the very souls of those they slew. So obviously the most interesting thing to note here is the presence of a legendary warrior who was said to have had black skin that no weapon could pierce, and warriors who raided the lands of the first men with black weapons that drank the souls of those they slew. Now it could be that the Ironborn in those days somehow had access to Valyrian steel, but with this information in mind, is it possible that the ancestors of the Ironborn brought with them more of these oily black stones than were used to build the sea stone chair? And if so, did they have knowledge of how to use these stones to forge weapons infused with magical properties? It's definitely possible, which could explain the presence of black weapons and armor. And considering that the accounts of these weapons and armor were found in records made by non-Ironborn first men, there seems to be a lot of weight to this idea. However, this is all just speculation, and we may never know the truth of the Ironborn's origins, nor of these black stones that seem to appear wherever dark and mysterious magic is found. But I think it's safe to say that all these mystical elements present in Ironborn myth and history could point to their origins being tied to some sort of long-forgotten magic and the people who wielded it. And what seems to be the case for the Ironborn is that they, more than any other peoples living in Westeros, hold within their possible origins, history, and culture significant mystical influences that cannot be discounted as mere over-exaggerated myth and legend. Why this matters as far as Euron's character is concerned is because he, as a direct blood descendant of these people, potentially holds within his person, much like like someone like Bran Stark does within his, the ability to unlock the latent magical potential that lies dormant within his people. And this notion could tie into several different theories about Euron's magical abilities. If we start with his Ironborn heritage, there's a hint given to us in A Feast for Crows that Bale Bard found that suggests Euron might be a skin changer. 
During the King's Moot, the Lord of House Farwind, Gilbert Farwind, stakes his claim to the Salt Throne by giving the following speech. Lord Gilbert began to speak. He told of a wondrous land beyond the Sunset Sea, a land without winter or want, where death had no dominion. Make me your king, and I shall lead you there, he cried. We will build 10,000 ships as Nymeria once did, and take sail with all our people to the land beyond the sunset. There every man shall be a king, and every wife a queen. His eyes, Aaron saw, were now gray, now blue, as changeable as the seas. Mad eyes, he thought, fool's eyes. The vision he spoke of was doubtless a snare set by the storm god to lure the ironborn to destruction. The offerings that his men spilled out before the king's moot included seal skins and walrus tusks, arm rings made of whalebone, war horns banded in bronze, leaving lesser men to help themselves to the gifts. When the fool was done talking and his champions began to shout his name, only the far winds took up the cry, and not even all of them. Now just prior to this speech, Aaron Dampair, Euron's younger brother and ardent follower of the drowned god, had the following thought. The far winds there were even queerer than the rest. Some said they were skin changers, unholy creatures who could take on the forms of sea lions, walruses, even spotted whales, the wolves of the wild sea. The possible connection to Euron here lies in the eyes, specifically when Aaron describes Gilbert's eyes as changing from gray to blue, like the waters of the sea. Euron's blue smiling eye has also been known to change depending on the circumstance, like when Euron's plans are being challenged by some of his lords after their conquest of the Shield Islands. Red Ralph Stonehouse bounded to his feet. Old Town is richer, and the arbor richer still. Redwine's fleet is off away. We need only reach out our hand to pluck the ripest fruit in Westeros. Fruit. The king's eye looked more black than blue. Only a craven would steal a fruit when he could take the orchard. Martin is fond of subtle hints of this nature, so this change of coloration in a suspected skin changer, and then in Euron as well, could hint at Euron's abilities in this regard. What makes this more plausible, though, are Euron's potential similarities to Bran Stark, another skin changer, or more specifically, his teacher, the Three-Eyed Crow. It's been suggested by many that much like Bran, Euron was once a student of the Three-Eyed Crow, or the Three-Eyed Raven as he's called in the show. In the books, the Three-Eyed Crow is believed to be a man known as Blood Raven, or Brynden Rivers, one of the great bastards of Aegon the Unworthy, whose story prior to his assumption of this identity is filled with accusations of blood magic and sorcery. The Three-Eyed Crow is a greenseer, a being capable of seeing into the past and the future, and infiltrating the dreams of others who also possess the power of sight, both dormant and active. And there are two things in particular that may point to Euron being either a once potential candidate for studentship under Blood Raven, or that he's a failed student of his. One is the nickname that Euron uses, and is often referred to by Crow's Eye. Euron has heterochromia iridium, or two different colored eyes, one blue and pleasant that is referred to as his smiling eye, and the other, which he keeps hidden behind an eye patch, that's described as black and shining with malice. Now it could be that he's called the crow's eye, because this eye looks similar to that of a crow's, but if it really is black under that eye patch, then it isn't similar to a crow's eye, as crow's eyes are not black, instead they're blue as babies, brown colored in their youth, and white in their adulthood. I think the more likely reason for this name here is that Euron gave it to himself after learning of his green sight through his contact with Bloodraven, and chose to name it his Crow's Eye as a reference to his powers and his association with the Three-Eyed Crow. However, others have noted that there might be an even deeper connection to Bloodraven here. Bloodraven's eyes are red, and it could be that Euron's eye isn't really black, but such a dark shade of blood red that it appears black, which would explain why he calls himself the Crow's Eye in reference to Bloodraven, and this would be why his sigil which would be another nod to this connection, is a crowned red eye with two crows flying above it. Though considering that Euron is speculated to be a failed student, it doesn't seem right to assume that Euron's sigil is necessarily a nod to Bloodraven, but more so his possible association with the red eye of a crow he saw in his dreams that tantalized him with flight and power and his own dark red eye. Another nod to his possession of this power, though, lies in a line he gives to his brother Victorion in A Feast for Crows. When I was a boy, I dreamt that I could fly, he announced. When I woke, I couldn't, or so the maester said. But what if he lied? Victorion could smell the sea through the open window, though the room stank of wine and blood and sex. The cold salt air helped to clear his head. What do you mean? Euron turned to face him. His bruised blue lips curled in a half smile. Perhaps we can fly, all of us. How will we ever know, unless we leap from some tall tower? This seems to be a reference to both Bran Stark's fall from a tower, and the similar dreams that Bran Stark had when he was being visited by the Three-Eyed Crow. Dreams where he could fly, and was spoken to by his eventual teacher, which then drove him to embark upon his journey north of the Wall, to receive guidance from him. An even further connection can be made between Euron and the Greenseers, through the Shade of the Evening that he likes to drink so much. As Bale Bard explained in his write-up on Euron, Shade of the Evening 
which is made with the blue leaves of a black bark tree, shares many similarities to werewood paste, a substance that Bran is instructed to ingest by Bloodraven to help unlock his powers. And this paste not only has a similar effect to Shade of the Evening, but it also tastes similarly foul upon first ingesting it, then strangely pleasant as one begins to digest it. Also, the bark of werewood trees is white and the leaves red, and in many ways, it would seem that Shade of the Evening and werewood paste are simultaneously cousins as well as opposites. And of course, there's the fact that Bloodraven mentions that the power of Greensight is in Bran's blood, the blood of the Starks, who in ages past were reported to be skin changers. And if Euron is indeed descended from a mystical race of people, then he too likely has this power in his blood. So after examining all this information, I think it's safe to say that Euron likely has Greensight, and he was probably once a candidate to become one of Bloodraven's students, but we'll discuss this more a bit later. Now there are many more magical persons and objects that Euron is involved with, or is potentially involved with, but these are the ways that Euron himself might be magical, and why he might have an affinity or desire for magic in general. But much like the Ironborn, there is much more to Euron Greyjoy than possible magical properties and origins. The Ironborn have a culture unlike any other in the known world, and were given a good description of their beliefs and practices through excerpts from A World of Ice and Fire. Yet however the Ironborn arose, it cannot be denied that they stand apart with customs, beliefs, and ways of governance quite unlike those common elsewhere in the Seven Kingdoms. All these differences, Archmaester Herrig asserts in his History of the Ironborn, are rooted in religion. These cold, wet, windswept islands were never well forested, and their thin soil did not support the growth of werewoods. No giants ever made their homes here, nor did the children of the forest walk what woods there were. The old gods worshipped by these elder races were likewise absent, and though the Andals did reach the islands eventually, their faith never took root here either, for another god had come before the Seven, the Drowned God, creator of the seas, and father of the Ironborn. The Drowned God has no temples, no holy books, no idols carved in his likeness, but he has priests aplenty. Since long before recorded history, these itinerant holy men have infested the Iron Islands, preaching his word and denouncing all other gods and those who follow them, ill-clad, unkempt, oft barefoot. The priests of the Drowned God have no permanent abode, but wander the islands as they will, seldom straying far from the sea. Most are illiterate, theirs is an oral tradition, and younger priests learn the prayers and rituals from the elder. Wherever they might wander, lords and peasants are obliged to give them food and shelter in the name of the drowned god. Some priests eat only fish. Most do not bathe, save in the sea itself. Men from other lands often think them mad, and so they may appear, but it cannot be denied that they wield great power. Though most ironborn have not but scorn for the seven of the south and the old gods of the north, they do recognize a second deity. In their theology, the drowned god is opposed by the storm god, a malignant deity who dwells in the sky and hates men and all their works. He sends cruel winds, lashing rains, and the thunder and lightning that bespeak his endless wrath. Some say that the Iron Islands are named for the ore that is found there in such abundance, but the Ironborn themselves insist that the name derives from their nature, for they are a hard people, as unbending as their god. Such riches as the Iron Islands possess lie under the hills of Great Wick, Harlaw, and Orkmont, where lead, tin, and iron can be found in abundance. These ores are the chief export of the islands. There are many fine metal workers amongst the ironborn, as might be expected. The forges of Lordsport produce swords, axes, ring mail, and plates second to none. The soil of the Iron Islands is thin and stony, more suitable for the grazing of goats than the raising of crops. The ironborn would surely suffer famine every winter, but for the endless bounty of the sea and the fisherfolk who reap it. The waters of Iron Man's Bay are home to great schools of cod, black cod, monkfish, skate, icefish, sardines, and mackerel. Crabs and lobsters are found along the shores of all the islands, and west of Great Wick, swordfish, seals, and whales roam the Sunset Sea. Archmaester Hake, born and raised on Harlaw, estimates that seven of every ten families on the Iron Islands are fisherfolk. However mean and poor these men might be on land, upon the sea, they are their own masters. The man who owns a boat need never be a thrall, Hake writes, for every captain is a king upon the deck of his own ship. It is their catch that feeds the islands, yet even more than the fishermen, ironborn esteem their reavers. Wolves of the sea, the men of the westerlands and riverlands name them in days of yore, and rightly. Like wolves, they oft hunted in packs, crossing stormy seas in their swift longships, and descending on peaceful villages and towns up and down the shores of the Sunset Sea to raid, rob, and assault. Fearless sailors and fearsome fighters, they would appear out of the morning mist to do their bloody work, and be back at sea before the sun had reached its zenith, their longships laden with plunder, and crowded with wailing children and frightened women. Archmaester Herrick has argued that it was a need for wood that first set the ironborn on this bloody path. In the dawn of days, there were extensive forests on Great Wick, Harlaw, 
and Orkmont, but the shipwrights of the Isles had such a voracious need for timber that one by one the woods vanished. So the Ironborn had no choice but to turn to the vast forests of the Greenlands, the mainland of Westeros. All that the islands lacked, the reavers found in the Greenlands. Little and less was taken in trade, much and more was bought in blood, with the point of a sword, or the edge of an axe. And when the reavers returned to the islands with such plunder, they would say that they had paid the iron price for it. Those who stayed behind paid the gold price to acquire these treasures, or went without. And thusly, Herrick tells us, were the reavers and their deeds exalted above all, by singers, small folk, and priests alike. Every member of a great house and every member of the small folk who live on the Iron Islands are poisoned by this idea. Yes, and I do mean poisoned. Westeros is a land that's likely seen more years of war than it has peace throughout its long history, and all the great houses and kingdoms of old are complicit in inflicting massive amounts of misery on these people, in various forms, since the dawn of days. No. The ironborn kill and plunder and assault, because it's what they do. As much as the sea is a large part of their culture, reaving is equally as important, and unless the world one day consisted solely of ironborn, they would never stop encroaching on the lands of others. As for the ironborn, it's not only historically been one of their primary means of supporting themselves, but it's a holy practice that they've been charged with carrying out by their sunken god. Now compared to the constant warfare that the other kingdoms have engaged in over the many centuries of their existence, the violent culture and practices of the Ironborn might not seem any more noteworthy than that of the other kingdoms and houses. While it is true that the other kingdoms are often at war with each other for one reason or another, there are few who espouse violence as one of the central creeds of their culture, notable exceptions being the Targaryens and the Boltons. But even then, it's specific houses that tend to incorporate violence into their respective cultures, and not the entirety of the kingdom they hail from. Even the Targaryens after the conquest only resorted to violence when they felt it necessary to quash rebellions, or in the case of Dorne, continue the portion of the conquest that had yet to be concluded. But violence is very much a part of the Ironborn's culture, and that means everyone from the lowliest beggar to the loftiest of kings are raised to believe that the life of a reaver is the most noble and virtuous life they could ever hope to lead, which has produced some of the most violent, warlike people that have ever terrorized these lands. So with that in mind, shouldn't this video be more so about the Ironborn themselves? Well, in a way it is. I think that Euron is the purest manifestation of the Ironborn housed in a single person, the culmination of thousands upon thousands of years of Ironborn traditions and culture that have resulted in the formation of a man like Euron Greyjoy. Euron is a man who, since the time he could walk and speak, has been immersed in this way of life. A lord of reavers descended from the Grey King himself, who was taught that being a violent plundering brute was something to be envied, not scorned. And in accordance with these ideals, Euron has become a monster beyond reckoning. And by all accounts, he was a terror, even in his youth. Euron is the fifth child of Lord Kellon Greyjoy. Euron had three elder half-brothers, Harlan, Quentin, and Donal, who were born from the union of Lord Kellon and his first wife Lady Stonetree. He also had four full-blooded siblings, those being his elder brother Balon, then Victarion, Euragon, and Aeron. And finally, he had one more half-sibling, Robin, the last of Lord Kellon's children, whose mother was his third wife Lady Piper. Euron has admitted to his brother Aeron that he murdered their eldest half-brother Harlan, who was unfortunately suffering from Grayscale by pinching his nose shut, and at this point, his mouth was turned to stone by Grayscale, so he could not cry out nor breathe from his mouth, and according to Euron, his eyes were frantic as he drained the life from him. Their youngest half-brother, Robin, was born sickly, and though Euron doesn't say how he killed him, he does remark that he had a soft head, so perhaps all Euron had to do here was give his youngest brother's head a squeeze to do the deed. Some have argued that these were actually mercy killings, considering his brother's conditions, and Euron stating when he tells Euron about these murders that they begged him to do it might be an indicator of this, but I'm more inclined to believe that Euron saw this as an opportunity to commit two murders that could never be traced back to him, and I wouldn't be surprised if Euron stating that they begged him to do it is another way of saying the phrase, they practically begged me to do it, which indicates Euron felt impelled to commit these murders because they were such easy marks. These two crimes are already horrific enough, but unfortunately there's more, and second to his murder of his siblings in his youth is Euron's admitted abuse of his younger siblings, Aeron and Euragon. Though it was hinted at prior to his admission of this abuse, through Aeron's thoughts being continually haunted by memories of Euron and the sound of a rusty hinge creaking as he entered his chambers, we were given official confirmation of these misdeeds from Euron himself in the Forsaken chapter of The Winds of Winter, when he was torturing Aeron below the decks of the Silence. It was me who taught you how to pray, little brother. Have you forgotten? I would visit your bedchamber at night when I had too much to drink. You shared a room with Euragon, high up in the sea tower. I could hear you praying from outside the door. I always wondered, were you praying that I would choose you, or that I would pass you by? Now obviously just knowing that he committed these crimes is horrendous enough, 
and gives us a pretty good idea of who Euron was when he was a child, and how he developed into the man he is. But because these crimes are central to his formation, and establishing a timeline for them would help us understand his progression from a once innocent child into an abusive and murderous monster, I'm about to do some unfortunately disgusting math to try and figure out when Euron did these things, with the help of the A Song of Ice and Fire wiki. It's hard to calculate exact ages for Euron and his siblings, but Aeron was supposedly around 16 years old when he named his first ship, and the Golden Storm sank during Balon's first rebellion, which means in 289 AC, Aeron had to be no older than 16 years old. Because Aeron's next eldest brother died at the age of 14 in 283 AC, and since Aeron had to be at least a year younger than his brother, he was at the very most 13 years old in 283 AC. For the sake of argument, let's say that Aeron was 12 in 283 AC. If that were the case, then Aeron was born in 269 AC and was 20 years old when Balon began his rebellion. Harlan Greyjoy, the eldest brother, was murdered by Euron before he reached manhood, which in this universe is 16. Aeron was old enough to vaguely remember Harlan, so let's say that Aeron was 4 years old when Harlan died at the age of 15. That would mean that Harlan was born in 258 AC. Since Harlan was the 8th son, and Euron is the 5th, that means that Euron had to have been born at least 4 years prior to Harlan, which would have made him at most 11 years old at the time he murdered Harlan. But for the sake of argument once again, let's say that Lord Kellon waited a bit before getting his wives with child, and say that Euron was 9 when he murdered his brother in 273 AC. So that would mean that Euron was born around 264 AC, making him 5 years older than Aeron, and 3 years older than Euragon. As far as his murder of Robin is concerned, let's assume once again that Robin was born in 271 AC, and since Robin was his second, let's say Euron murdered his youngest brother three years later, in 274 AC, when Euron was ten years old. Now considering Euron says that he would come and wander into Aeron and Euragon's tower when he was drunk to abuse them, I'm going to assume that Euron had to 1. be old enough to overpower them, and 2. be of a reasonable age to begin drinking. Let's say the earliest Euron may have started drinking was 15, and so it's reasonable to assume that a 15-year-old could overpower a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. So while it's possible that Euron began abusing his siblings from a younger age, it makes sense that it would have been around this age when he began doing so, as that would align well enough with a typical time frame one begins feeling sexual urges. But there's another possible set of abusive crimes Euron committed during the time period he abused Aeron and Euragon, abusing the three sons of Balon Greyjoy, Roderick, Marin, and Theon. Though we don't really know anything about Marin, Las Carcosa has theorized that Theon's bad memories of Euron and his shining malicious black eye might be a nod to the fact that Euron, who might switch around his eye patch when committing personal atrocities, assaulted Theon as well, which is why Theon remembers what his eye looks like. As for Roderick, he postulates that because Theon remembers Roderick as a belligerent foul-mouthed drunk, that perhaps Roderick, despite being quite young when he died during the rebellion, was a habitual drunkard because he too was also abused by Euron. And while this theory is admittedly based only on a few tidbits of information, it wouldn't exactly be out of line with Euron character. So if we take this possibility into account, that would mean then that the timeline of Euron's crimes is as follows. When he was 9, he murdered his eldest brother Harlan, aged 15. When he was 10, he murdered his youngest brother Robin, aged 3. And when he was 15 years old, he began abusing his brothers Euragon and Aeron. And sometime around this same time period, he may have started abusing Roderick, Marin, and then Theon years later. And he likely did so for several years after he started these patterns of abuse. So that would mean that Euron began his life of cruelty first as a kinslaying murderer, then as an abuser. Which doesn't seem like an unexpected beginning for a man entrenched in the culture of the Ironborn. However, was it really only Ironborn culture that played a part in Euron's devious activities as a youth and his subsequent growth into a man of equally ill repute? No, but it certainly played a part in it. However, you'll often find that people who dole out violence and abuse to others typically suffered much the same to their own person when they were a child. But in Euron's case, somehow that doesn't seem likely, as his father Lord Kellon was by all accounts a good man, and there has never been any mention by Euron or his other siblings of receiving abuse from any other family members. Something that does seem likely, though, can be found in a theory proposed by Bale Bard. One thing that we haven't discussed yet in our possible timeline of Euron's childhood is his contact by Bloodraven when he was a child. Bale theorizes that the reason Euron began committing these horrendous crimes when he was a child was because Euron, after being contacted by Bloodraven, who came to him as a sort of god, who promised Euron that he too would be a god in turn, was eventually abandoned by him because Bloodraven saw who Euron really was, or who he would become, an ironborn monster who would take the tenants of his people and magnify them tenfold. It's possible, though, that Bloodraven's abandonment is what caused Euron to go down the this path, 
Once Euron had felt the presence of this god, and had been made promises of power by that god, he obtained a high unlike anything you could imagine. And when that god left him, he wanted desperately to gain his attention once again, so he might bathe in the power that he had promised him. And in his efforts to do so, Euron likely tried everything he could think of, from communing with the drowned god, to offering sacrifices on altars. But when all of those things inevitably failed, Euron turned to spiting the gods instead, first by kinslaying, then by abusing his siblings and nephews. And after each of these horrid actions, Euron would go and piss into the sea, mocking the drowned god, and all other gods listening, with his crimes and his heresy. And so after doing these things, and never suffering any punishment for them, Euron came to the conclusion that not only would the gods no longer speak to him, but that they didn't care at all about the supposed sins that one could commit against them. And most importantly, they could care less about whatever horrid things Euron planned to do with his life. And so Euron became all that his brother would eventually accuse him of being, a godless man who cared not for the laws of gods and men. So while Euron was raised to glorify violence, it was these ideals, along with his idea to spit in the face of his god and see whether he'd be slapped for it, that drove him to committing the crimes that he committed when he was a youth. And the idea that the gods don't really care what the people of the world do shaped Euron's worldview to the point that he became a nihilist in its most extreme form, one whose actions have no limit and one that will do anything, anything at all, so long as it pleases him or gets him what he wants. But now we've arrived at a very important question. What does Euron want? Well, there are many possible answers to that question, and we're going to explore quite a few of them. But first, let's get familiar with how Euron's story unfolded once he reached adulthood. Our earliest record of Euron's activities as an adult is his goading of his father alongside his brothers Balon and Victorian to enter Robert's rebellion on Robert's side, and he likely participated in the Battle of the Mander alongside his brothers and father. And this is perhaps the first instance of Euron's open admittance of his proclivity for the old way, as Lord Kellon had actually been attempting to reform the Ironborn culture so it would become more in line with those of the other kingdoms. Our next account of Euron is given to us during another rebellion, this time in his brother Balon's first rebellion. Euron was the one who helped secure the Iron born a swift victory at the outset of the war, when he devised a plan to sail to Lannisport and burn the Lannister fleet at anchor, which his brother Victorion carried out successfully. Now these two actions seem to be rooted in standard Ironborn and Westerosi affairs, and while they're not exactly fantastic things to do, we can count them amongst the lesser evils that Euron has committed. Likewise, it's been said that Euron was often away reaving on his ship, the Silence, and it seems that he spent little of his own time on the Iron Islands. However, in 297 AC, when Euron was on the islands, he either seduced or assaulted one of Victorion's salt wives, which earned him a banishment from his brother Balon. And considering Victorion wanted to murder his brother for this crime, that punishment was quite light, which is reflected in Euron's laughter that he directed at Victorion as he left the islands aboard the Silence. Speaking of the Silence, this ship and its captain have cultivated a fearsome reputation, which is exemplified in Euron stating that from Ibn to Ashai, when men see his sails, they pray. And indeed, this ship that has a deck painted blood red to hide the many bloodstains adorning it, that's crewed by mutes whose tongues have been ripped out either by Euron personally or on his orders, is certainly something that would invoke fear into anybody. However, one thing that's uncertain is whether or not the Silence gained its fearsome reputation after Euron was exiled or while he was reaving when he was still allowed on the Iron Islands. Considering his Bastards, who are older than three years old, are described as base-born mongrels, and his crew is supposedly made up of the same type of mongrels. I imagine that the silence gained its fearsome reputation long before Euron was exiled, making his unscrupulous tactics something that Euron has been openly versed in for quite some time now. Regardless, after Euron departed the islands, the silence was reported pillaging, plundering, and assaulting all across the world. And Euron claims during this time period to have taken his flagship as far as Ashai, which I believe he did. And he even claims to have walked amongst the ruins of old Valyria, which I, and many others, are doubtful of. But even so, he surely tread elsewhere when he was in exile. So is there any source we can look to for more insight into his activities during this time period? Well, as luck would have it, the lovely people whose theories I've been pulling from throughout this video have pointed me in the right direction. However, his activities during these three years, and the basis of all the theories we're going to be discussing from here on out, are tied to that ever-present question I said we needed to answer earlier. What does Euron want? Well, while there's a lot of variation between these theories, they're all underpinned by what seems to be Euron's one true goal, the obtainment of power. But more specifically, he's trying to discover and obtain the secrets of the various magics of this world that will then allow him to conquer and rule this world, so he might toy with it and its people in any way that he should desire. Euron never forgot that high he felt when he was visited by Bloodraven as a child, and it would seem that since then he slowly formulated a plan to obtain that high once again, and obtain everything he's ever wanted in the process, and mock the gods even further by becoming a beacon of death and destruction. Euron has been described as a captain who never takes any of the spoils of his conquest for himself, and I think it's fair to assume that the reason he's so open-handed with his loot is because Euron's eye is ever set on the bigger picture, and to Euron, 
What do a few golden trinkets, or parcels of land matter, when faced with the prospect of lordship over the entire world? During the events of the story, we first officially encounter Euron on the Iron Islands, after he's had his brother murdered, possibly by a faceless man, which we'll get into later. And here we find a man who's quickly solidified his position, as the eldest heir in line to sit the Seastone chair, by rallying various lords to his side, through gifts and promises of further wealth and glory down the line. Euron, before he was introduced here, was described as quite the terror, and indeed, once we're introduced to the man himself, he proves to be a sly, cunning, highly intelligent, facetious, merciless, cruel, brutal, and sadistic man, one who utterly despises men like his brother Aaron, who's put so much faith in a god that cares not for his plight or any prayer that he might have to offer. This pious brother of his, most fervent priest of the drowned god, calls for a king's moot, which is the election of a new king of the Ironborn through the mutual consensus of the captains and lords of the Iron Islands, an unprecedented procedure that hasn't occurred for thousands of years. At the king's moot, many stake their claim, but it is Euron, with lips dyed blue from his abuse of the mystical and potent psychedelic drug, Shade of the Evening, who wins the day with the blasting of a hellish horn that makes a sound like the screaming of a thousand souls that has all who hear it feel as if their very bones are aflame and searing their flesh from within, and with treasures immeasurable, spilling about the feet of his would-be loyal subjects, and of course, promises of not just a return to the old ways of reaving, but of conquest of all of Westeros using the power of dragons, which he claims he can bind to his will with this mysterious horn that's decorated with burning Valyrian glyphs. After he's declared king, Euron takes the Ironborn on a successful campaign to capture the Shield Islands in the Reach, and he then rewards some of the dissident elements amongst the ranks of his captains and lords with lordship over the Isles. And afterwards, he plans to sail the Iron Fleet forth from here to Marine to capture one, or possibly all of Daenerys's dragons. Euron is persuaded by the Reader, the Lord of Harlaw, to only send one ship to Marine to accomplish this task, and so he sends his brother Victorion on his flagship, and while he's away, as others have theorized, he likely hopes that the Redwine Fleet will return turn to the shields and strike down the enemy lords that he raised to lordship over these islands. And so he sends his brother Victorion on his flagship with the dragon horn aboard his deck to accomplish just that. The last time we see Euron in the first chapter of The Winds of Winter, we find him aboard his own ship, where he's likely trailing his brother, and here retreated to the gruesome torture of his other brother Aaron, punishment for Aaron's attempts to rally the common folk against Euron. And that's essentially the story of Euron Greyjoy that we have so far, but I'll regale you with some of the details a little later on. So right away, Euron reveals that he has access to a magical artifact, and the plans he has to use that artifact to bind similarly magical beings to his will, and we have somewhat of an idea about how he's going to go about it. And many have speculated that his plans and his methods for achieving those plans lies in his previously mentioned disregard for the gods, as well as something else I haven't mentioned yet. His desire to once again feel and obtain the power he felt when he was visited by Bloodraven as a child. As others have mentioned in their theories, Euron has not only displayed his blatant disregard for gods, but has continually been searching for the means to acquire the power of a god. And while we have a pretty good idea of the baseline goal of what he plans to achieve with that power, the specifics of what he's going to do with it once he gets it is something we'll explore through the theories we're going to cover later on. Let's get back to what Euron was up to during his three years of exile. And if we keep in mind that he was likely searching for further knowledge of magic and magical artifacts during this time period, I think we can draw some pretty significant conclusions using the information we're given in the text. In the Vince That Was Promised essay on Euron, he mentions an essay and corresponding map created by a user by the name of Sir Dunk the Lunk over on Reddit. In Sir Dunk's essay, he puts forth the notion that a new Corsair king that we see mentioned a few times throughout the series, that has created a new kingdom of terror for himself in the infamous pirate haven of the Basilisk Isles, is in fact Euron in disguise, and this Corsair king has also made appearances reaving in the Summer Isles, and we've also seen a report that he was in Astapor, inquiring about purchasing a hundred unsullied. Likewise, it's been theorized that a character by the name of Eurathon Nightwalker, who Zaro Zohan Doxus mentions in A Clash of Kings after Daenerys burns down the House of Undying, is also Euron in disguise. Here is what Zaro says when he mentions Eurathon. It is said that the glass candles are burning in the House of Eurathon Nightwalker, that have not burned in a hundred years. Now glass candles are a magical item of particular interest that appear in the novels, and they're said to give the users of them the ability to see over long distances, see strange visions and dreams, and communicate with others across long distances, which is something that I'm sure Euron would be interested in. Also, Eurathon is a common enough ironborn name, which may be enough of an indicator that he is Euron, but in a world of ice and fire, we're given further proof through a story about a former king named Eurathon Goodbrother IV, who shares some similarities with Euron. Upon the death of King Euragon Greyiron III, Euragon the Bald, his younger sons hurriedly convened a king's moot whilst their elder brother Torgon was raiding up the Mander, thinking that one of them would be chosen to wear the Driftwood crown. To their dismay, the captains and kings chose Eurathon Goodbrother of Great Wick instead. The first thing that the new king did was command that the sons of the old king be put to death. 
For that, and for the savage cruelty he oft displayed during his two years as king, Urathon Goodbrother IV is remembered in history as Bad Brother. This story will be important later on, but I think it's safe to say that the likelihood that Euron is this Urathon Nightwalker is quite high. So if we take these two identities, and assume that they are in fact Euron, then we know that he's been to the Basilisk Isles, the Summer Isles, Astapor, Karth, and by his own admission, Ashai, and maybe even Valyria. The trick now is figuring out in what order he visited each of these cities, and why he was there at all. The theorizers I mentioned at the beginning of this video all have given some insight into this, and I think they're right about the last few months of his exile, but I have a different theory to offer on where he started his journey. Because Euron is so focused on magic and gods, it's reasonable to assume that he would have headed to a place that is rumored to be dripping with magic, a shy, and along the way, he might have also stopped by or even explored Old Valyria, another ancient hub of magic. It's also possible that the magically inclined Euron felt drawn to Ashai due to his people's connection with the oily black stones that the buildings there are made of, the same stones that his ancestors may have used to create weapons and armor, and definitely used to create the fabled sea stone chair. But we'll be touching on this possibility a little later on, when we get deeper into some of these theories. Now I imagine that one so magically curious as Euron would want to spend as much time as he felt necessary in such a mystical place, and during his three years in exile, I wouldn't be surprised if he spent two of them in Ashai, or at least used Ashai as his preferred port of calling as he reaved around Essos. After his time in Ashai, it would be reasonable to assume that Euron left seeking more knowledge of magic in Karth from the warlocks in the House of the Undying and elsewhere in the city. And here is where he set himself up as Eurathon Nightwalker and developed his taste for the shade of the evening, dwelling there until a long-awaited sign for his departure was presented to him, the arrival of Daenerys Targaryen and her dragons, and the lights glowing upon his glass candles after she destroyed the House of the Undying. From here, as Sir Dunk laid out in his essay and map, Euron left Karth and sailed to Astapor, and it's been hinted that Euron obtained his dragon horn from a group of three warlocks led by the head warlock Pyat Pri, and they also may have been sailing for Daenerys to seek revenge on her for burning down the House of the Undying around the same time. When Euron arrived in Astapor to further investigate Daenerys and her dragons, it was here that Euron took on the identity of the Corsair King. And when Euron arrived in Astapor to further investigate Daenerys and her dragons, perhaps he reasoned that their status as younglings at that time was not the opportune moment for him to seize them for himself by using the horn. Or maybe he thought he wouldn't be able to, considering she had just recently obtained a massive army of Unsullied. So whether to bide his time, or to marshal his forces, Euron set sail from Astapor and settled in the Basilisk Isles for a time, perhaps choosing to visit them due to the presence of another Blackstone structure of mystical origin, and a possible offshoot of his own Ironborn, the Toad Idol on Toad Isle, and the fish-like people who live there. Sometime in between Karth and these islands, it's theorized that Euron, after obtaining a dragon egg in Ashai, which he had contracted a mirish wizard to hatch within a year, who he then killed sometime later when he failed to do so before the year he gave him to accomplish this task was out, supposedly threw it in the sea when he was in one of his foul moods. But instead, it's theorized that he may have offered the egg to the Faceless Men as payment for a contract, and that it was in fact the Faceless Men, and not Euron, who went ahead of him to assassinate his brother prior to Euron's arrival, so he could claim his crown when he himself arrived. Now after spending some time with his long-lost cousins, Euron headed for the Iron Islands, along the way making a stop in the Summer Isles to resupply and do a bit of reaving. And it's here that he may have captured the Dusky Woman, whom he later gifted to his brother Victorion, a woman who might have a part to play in the coming Binding of the Dragons. And sometime after the Summer Islands, Euron finally arrived in the Iron Islands to declare his kingship over the Ironborn. Now I mentioned earlier that Euron had likely been reaving in Essos prior to his exile, and others have mentioned that during that time, he might have already visited these places to seek the magical and mystical elements of the world. But I think it's reasonable to suggest that he didn't spend all too much time in any of these places then, but he found ample opportunity to do so after his exile, and his progression from dreaded reaver who daydreamed of power and glory to a man actively seeking it started at the beginning of his exile. Obviously what I've just presented to you could be entirely wrong, but for the sake of furthering our discussion on Euron, we're going to assume that we now have a pretty good idea of what Euron was up to during his exile. But now we can start talking about what he might have been doing in each of these places. Now Euron has been seen in visions by his brother Aaron sitting on the Iron Throne atop a mountain of skulls, with the dead bodies of all the various gods of the world strewn about it. And a red priest that's currently accompanying Victorion to Marine, by the name of Makoro, had in the past described a vision he'd seen of a monstrous figure with ten long arms and one black eye that was sailing on a blood-soaked sea when he was speaking with Daenerys. So it's safe to say that there's some heavy foreshadowing to suggest that Euron is going to attempt to use everything he's found to defy the gods and bring death and destruction to the world. 
As I stated earlier, the idea that Euron is looking to accomplish something like this underpins all the speculation about what his true motives are. So now that we've gone over all this information, let's talk about how it all ties into the various theories people have put forth about his character. One theory that I find particularly interesting, albeit probably a bit far-fetched, that comes to us courtesy of Genghis Kazoo, is his theory stating that Euron is the fabled Azor Ahai, the man supposedly destined to conquer the Night and the White Walkers. But not only does Genghis predict that he's Azor Ahai, but that he's also been possessed by the Bloodstone Emperor, or that he's the Bloodstone Emperor reborn. I'm not going to read his entire theory for you, and you can read it yourself by clicking the link in the description down below. But I will try to summarize it as best as I can, and interweave it with some of my own findings on Euron, as well as portions of others' theories as well. Genghis points out that Azor Ahai, though supposedly a legendary figure who once saved humanity during the first long night, that is fabled to return to do so once again, is actually a figure that was inspired by another figure in Hinduism, called Asura Ahi, who is not such a great entity, and Euron is also similar to another mythological figure, the Irish entity Baylor the Fomorian, a member of a supernatural race of malevolent entities called Fomorians, and Baylor dwelt in a high tower on an island, which is quite similar to the high tower of Old Town, which we'll talk about more in a bit. Now the Bloodstone Emperor was an infamous ruler of the Great Empire of the Dawn, the empire that served as the progenitor to the Golden Empire of Yi-T, which currently rules the eponymous region in the far eastern part of Essos, and were given a short history of him and his reign in a world of ice and fire. When the daughter of the Opal Emperor succeeded him as the Amethyst Empress, her envious younger brother cast her down and slew her, proclaiming himself the Bloodstone Emperor and beginning a reign of terror. He practiced dark arts, torture, and necromancy, enslaved his people, took a tiger woman for his bride, feasted on human flesh, and cast down the true gods to worship a black stone that had fallen from the sky. Many scholars count the Bloodstone Emperor as the first high priest of the sinister Church of Starry Wisdom, which persists to this day in many port cities throughout the known world. In the annals of the further east, it was the blood betrayal, as his usurpation is named, that ushered in the Age of Darkness called the Long Night. Despairing of the evil that had been unleashed on the earth, the maiden made of light turned her back upon the world, and the lion of night came forth in all his wrath to punish the wickedness of men. How long the darkness endured, no man can say, but all agree that it was only when a great warrior, known variously as Hirkun the hero, Azor Ahai, Yin Tar, Nefarion, and Eldrick Shadow Chaser, arose to give courage to the race of men and lead the virtuous into battle with his blazing sword Lightbringer that the darkness was put to rout, and light and love returned once more to the world. Now Genghis speculates that Azor Ahai and the Bloodstone Emperor are one and the same, and that history has been revised to paint Azor Ahai as this heroic figure, who unfortunately was actually an extension of the same problem that the Bloodstone Emperor created. Now I'm going to deviate a bit from Genghis's theory here. I think that this is possible, and that the Bloodstone Emperor perhaps stopped the Long Night in Ashai, where the legends of Azor Ahai originate, and it was here where he dwelt in exile following his instigation of the Long Night. And then after ending the Long Night, the Bloodstone Emperor made his way from Ashai to Yin, then to Toad Isle, and finally, with the fish-like Toad Islanders in tow, to the Iron Islands where he lived out the rest of his days, ruling from the Sea Stone Chair. And perhaps he was even the fabled Grey King, who later ruled from Naga's Jaw, extending his life through blood magic and sorcery, and siring those hundred sons of his via these fish-like people. And this of course would explain his ability to slay a sea dragon, the presence of the sea stone chair, the ironborn sea-based origins, their possible use of weapons and armor made from the oily black stone substance, and why Euron may have been drawn to a shy because of his blood relation to this man. So as a direct descendant of this man, who is possibly possessed by him, or is receiving visions and messages from him via his green sight, or the shade of the evening, Euron is in a position to accomplish a bevy of impressive feats, like potentially conquering Old Town and unlocking the secrets of the Blackstone Fortress the High Tower sits atop. And from there, crafting weapons and armor from the stones there, using the secrets he discovered during his travels. He could also possibly forge a new Lightbringer from the legendary sword Dawn that's wielded by the Swords of the Morning of House Dane. Or, he could even wake a legendary stone dragon who may have fought with Valerian the Black Dread long ago that could reside in the ruins of Old Valyria by sacrificing one of Daenerys' dragons there. And considering the legend of Azor Ahai began in Ashai, it's even possible that Euron is part of some larger conspiracy that the people of Ashai have been plotting since the Bloodstone Emperor left them long ago. And all of these things would surely enable Euron to achieve his dreams of spitting in the face of the gods by acquiring some of their power and using that power to play out every dark desire he has ever had in further defiance of them, much like his possible ancestor once did centuries prior. Or he could accomplish all or some of these things without being the descendant of this legendary figure. And he'll simply use everything he's learned about magic and all the dark devices of the world to unleash hell. But something else that adds another layer to these theories could lie in how Euron's story might end. 
It could be that due to their seemingly intertwined fates, it's Daenerys who's destined to bring an end to his reign of terror, either when it begins, or before then. Or as another theorizer put forth, that Euron's ties to Eurothon Goodbrother IV portends that his story will end in a similar way to Eurothon's, as Eurothon was deposed when his nephew Torgon came back from Reaving, and thereafter, Torgon was known as Torgon the Latecomer. And in Euron's case, perhaps his story will end in a similar way, with his nephew, in this case, Theon the Latecomer, coming to save the world and put a stop to his dark designs. Or hell, as Yez and IRL has theorized, it could be Samwell Tarly who stops Euron, Sam the Slayer who put down a White Walker, who's currently stationed in Old Town, where Euron is likely to show up soon enough. Now, as fantastic and as probable as all or some of what we've discussed so far is, the reason I've gone through all the trouble to highlight the potential mythical and magical elements surrounding Euron's character is to emphasize that he is someone who, by virtue of whatever magical device ends up being his chosen method to conquer the world, is an insanely dangerous person whose story is liable to end with him unleashing some sort of hell upon the people of this world. And because there are so many possibilities in the text in regards to Euron, any of these theories could be true, or none of them could be. But regardless of what will prove to be true, and what is mere fantasy, there's something that I believe will prove to be true no matter what, that Euron is utterly insane. So far, we've discussed quite a few things that have led me to this conclusion. His rearing in a culture that glorifies violence, his visitation by a magical entity that drove him to formulating his nihilistic mindset and desire for godlike power, and the subsequent crimes he went on to commit to prove his worldview and achieve his goals through the acquirement of heinous magical power. But you also have to consider that Euron is not just a man with this mad mission to find and use magical power and take over the world, but one who has immersed himself in violence and horror for nearly every day of his life since he was nine years old. A man who further explored these horrors aboard a ship filled with mutes, where the only company he had was his deranged thoughts. And a man who then went on to heavily abuse a psychedelic drug to the point that his lips have almost been dyed black. So of course Euron is a man who commits mass murder, cuts out the tongues of his crewmen, assaults an untold number of people, tortures his own followers, tortures his own family, licks his finger after he wipes off the spit his brother just hawked in his face, and as we've seen in the first chapter of The Winds of Winter, a man who even cuts the tongue out of his pregnant lover and ties her naked to the prow of his ship, alongside his brutally tortured brother, whom he also abused as a child. And of course, the gifts that Euron showers people with, as many have noted in the novels, are poisoned. And they're poisoned because any gift he bestows upon others is rooted in the insanity that is his person. And everything that Euron touches, not just his gifts, are inevitably poisoned by that insanity, just as the Ironborn have been poisoned by their culture. And for his Ironborn people, he will surely end up being their downfall. As I said earlier on, Euron in many respects is the culmination of all the Ironborn are and what they hope to be. And because what that is is a monster monstrous being of brutality, merciless cruelty, and megalomania, he will be their greatest champion, as well as the final nail in the coffin that they have been constructing since they first created and promoted this culture of violence and horror so many thousands of years ago. Because building a culture around reaving and plundering is an insanity that I'm surprised hasn't broken the Ironborn before now. So yes, it could be that Euron is a skin changer, a former student of Bloodraven who has similar powers to Bran, and that Dragonhorn of his may very well be able to bind dragons to his will. And in all likelihood, Euron has an affinity for magic that enables him to accomplish feats of sorcery that others are incapable of. It could be that he's the Grey King reborn, and the Drowned God has chosen him to be his champion that will sink the world. It could be that Euron is Azor Ahai, and the representative of the Bloodstone Emperor, or even the purported devil of this universe, the Great Other, as it is hinted that Euron is serving someone other than himself. And through the power of that Other, he might have the potential to reign for a thousand years as the new fiery god of a broken world. It could even be that Euron is the avatar of the Storm God, mortal enemy of the Drowned God, and with him where he goes he brings the storm, and in the wake of that storm, perhaps much like his flagship, it will be the silence that follows such a storm that will be Euron's legacy. But beneath all the magic and mystery lies a man who's insane beyond reckoning. And this is why Euron Greyjoy, more than any other living character in this story, has the potential to cause the most harm to this world and its people. Joffrey Baratheon was a cruel and belligerent king who was liable to torture his populace for his own amusement well into his old age, if he had made it there. Ramsay Bolton is sadistic terror made flesh, who has committed some of the most sickening crimes against humanity. And his father Roos looms ever larger than his son. Peter Baelish might very well outmaneuver all the great houses and seat himself on the Iron Throne, causing a heavy amount of suffering in his own right. But Euron wishes to use magic powers that I believe he has only a passing knowledge of to put the entire world under his thumb. And that power, more than any number of thousands of swords, is liable to cause death and destruction on a scale that this world filled with death and destruction could never have imagined. 
So does he know what to do with any of it, or does he have a vague idea of what he wants, how to get it, and is making things up as he goes along? Euron is highly intelligent, so I'm sure in some ways he does, and in many ways I'm sure he doesn't, and that will definitely contribute to his downfall. And as much as any of these fantastic outcomes we've discussed are very much possible, and were quite fun to explore, and as much as Euron might believe he can become a terrible god-king of immeasurable evil, I think that whatever confidence he has in his ability to use the forces he's acquired to achieve that goal is misguided, as Euron, much like the Ironborn he represents, will undoubtedly meet his ultimate end through the very evil he's tried to cultivate, but not before he's unleashed his insanity upon the world at large. And it's for all these reasons, and reasons yet to come, that I believe Euron is the most dangerous and diabolical villain who ever drew breath in the world of ice and fire. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Euron? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.